like they said, they can't get no replacement parts. The Canadian County Jail is the state's oldest lockup. According to health department inspectors, it's also one of the state's worst. Jail inspectors this week found 30 violations of state jail standards at the overcrowded facility. I mean, like they said, they can't get no replacement parts for the toilets, you know. They, see that they don't even make those kind of toilets anymore. They can't, uh, the air conditioning system ain't no good. It's outdated. Everything's outdated. That's why they need a new jail. The health department today ordered the jail closed. A hearing on the order is set for November 23rd. Canadian County Sheriff Jerry Russell isn't waiting for November 23rd to find out if his jail will be shut down. He's making arrangements now to ensure his 32 prisoners a place to stay. We are going to start immediately trying to locate uh, places to handle our prisoners if on the 23rd the judge does shut us down. Moving prisoners to nearby jails would be a quick fix. The long-term solution would be to build a new lockup. However, Canadian County voters turned thumbs down last week on a proposal to build a new $2 million jail. Scott Wallace, Action 4 in El Reno. They're of higher intellectual level. They have a good, strong, moral sense of who they are that may or may not be religious, but what's right or wrong for me, and they're disillusioned about society. They want to do something to go out and change the world a bit. We live in, in a society now where uh, we're just bombarded by all kinds of stuff. You know, we can't, nobody, we can't keep track of what's going on in this world. It's so complex. We're so taught that we've got to be so open-minded, we've got to consider every point of view, we've got to be Mr. 20th century cosmopolitan man or woman, and that whole vague philosophy um, that is propounded educationally, religiously, philosophically is basically, I call it airhead logic. They very definitely offer to people a whole different way of looking at the world and that's going to change everything. I think that as soon as the conditions which produce them uh, dissipate, the cults themselves tend really to dissipate. But if those conditions don't dissipate? Well, then you're going to have more problems than the cults uh, to cope with. As we stated in the beginning of our series, we have covered a phenomena of our times. Like a play, let the actors tell the story. But the actors were real people with real stories to tell. We've covered a lot of heavy subjects this week, religions, the Bible, kidnapping, deprogramming, and mind control. Maybe we should all do more thinking. George Tomic, Action 4.
Members of the legislative leadership have been fighting hard against tax cuts, warning that revenue drops were just beyond the horizon. Now, talk of tax cuts is expected to drop along with state revenues. The hard job for lawmakers next year will be trying to minimize the ill effects of the state's losses, which are blamed on a poor national economy, drops in energy production, and cutbacks in federal funds. Wherever the blame goes, Representative Cleta Detheridge, House Budget and Appropriations Chairman, says that for a state determined not to go into debt, there is only one answer. Our primary job is to be more businesslike, to try to do a better job of tracking and, and accounting for dollars, managing dollars better, being more efficient. All of those things can help us um, stretch our resources, just like in my household budget. You have to be more resourceful when you have fewer dollars, and that's what we're going to have to be, and that's what every agency is going to have to be. One of the most costly state expenses is employment. Deathridge says a freeze won't solve the problem. Instead, lawmakers will have to look at ways to cut the state's payroll without having an adverse effect on the state's services. In addition, the state will have to decide what services it can do away with altogether. Not very popular decisions, but decisions that Deathridge says the state has to make. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. It's nearly sunset at Camp Kickapoo. This Boy Scout troop works extra hard to get the campsite ready before darkness sets in. There's no doubt who's running the show. Chris, go ahead now and get one of the legs. Get one of the legs and come on up with it. Yep. Come on, Chris, get in here. Okay, here. Help him do it. Come on. Now lift it up. Here. Come on. Yeah. Get two more poles. You okay? Yeah. Scoutmaster Lewis Johnson has two loves, people and nature. Lewis shares that love with his boys. Yeah, yeah that looks good. The scouts of Troop 61 mean the world to Lewis. Many of the boys have serious physical and mental handicaps. That makes Lewis love them even more. Okay, help his hand oh, there. Quick. He has trouble. Oh. Well, he's going to get to where he can do as good as anybody. Once they get into the troop, get into the group, become a part of it, they begin to reevaluate themselves. They forget about the negatives that they've heard about themselves. They take on a positive attitude. First thing you know, he's accomplished something he didn't think to do. And then there's no end to his dream. Forgot the first story, didn't you, already? All right. Up and at him. Time to go. Get your bunch of going here. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Cut that out. Lewis Johnson developed an interest in his special brand of scouting when he adopted a handicapped boy of his own. Boy Scouts accepted boys with physical and mental handicaps, but there wasn't a program made especially for them. That's why Lewis started Troop 61. Okay, right up in here. The boy will develop a positive attitude when he gets with other people with the positive attitude. And I, I can tell you this, from experience, it's almost impossible to do that in a home environment. Too much tendency to help, too much tendency to uh, reflect the disability. And if you can put them out uh, like they are here on their own, where they're allowed to break the eggs, allowed to cook the eggs, allowed to turn the bacon, you know, let them get their hands in it. That's what I say. And let them do the things that they've never been expected to do. Looking mighty good. Lewis Johnson's put in thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours, and a lot of love building this special campsite. It's a second home for him and his special scouts. But the heart and soul of this 270 acres is a nature trail open to anyone. Now most of us take trees, animals, and fresh air for granted. But for the handicapped, seeing nature firsthand can be an emotional experience. I 
the birds, I like to hear them sing. I like to hear the trees grow. I like to hear the grass. I feel closer to God out here than I did in place else. I've had them go out there and be emotionally overcome, just with, with glee, you know, just overpowered with their feelings. And of course, that's what makes it all worthwhile. Louis Johnson has spent most of his 70 years making a lot of people's dreams come true. His dream is to see scout troops like this established all over the state. He says he doesn't have much time left. But with a heart as big as Lewis's, anything is possible. He's proved it. Mark O'Neill, Action 4. A very, very worthwhile day and that we most definitely should continue uh, to visit schools. Congratulations. <laughs> it's at the Lincoln Plaza, and it, it is our opportunity to meet. The specific action will be, in, a, in addition to uh, beginning an evaluation of the uh, principal, will also be to uh, uh, recommend changes in the present policy and recommend changes in the present regulations to. Uh, try to assure ourselves and the community that, uh, that another occurrence of the nature which did occur there might happen elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen. The defense attorney on four separate occasions asked the hearing judge to disqualify himself on the grounds of bias and prejudice. You know, he declined, obviously, to do so. One thing that needs to be cleared up, the man is not a judge. He is an attorney 
who was chosen to act as a hearing officer. So in the sense of an elected judge or an appointed judge, he's not a judge, he's a, he's a lawyer. And I want to become involved when I get out. This is an inmate presenting his case to the Oklahoma Pardon and Parole Board. The board is holding their monthly meeting. Yesterday, a record 337 inmates were released on the Christmas commutation docket. The board has seen a thousand inmates this time around. They have also noticed a disturbing development. We can see uh, a lot more inmates that, that are coming before us. There seems to be a bigger docket that we have. Um, it also appears that the violent offender has increased somewhat. And we have had more violent offenders coming up before us in the last six months uh, to a year. Uh, that's the disturbing element. In terms of dollars, what would you estimate the value of the drug that you had your house? This phase of the parole program is the board interview. Questions are posed to the inmate. It's a quick interview, and the ultimate decision is hardly influenced by this session. The real decision is made earlier, when the inmate's file is studied and evaluated. And faced with a combination of overcrowding and a more violent criminal, that evaluation has become more difficult these days. A final footnote to this story, one little known fact about the Oklahoma pardon and parole system, only 7% of inmates paroled are repeat offenders in Oklahoma. That figure is twice as good as any other state in the nation. Kevin Ogle, Action 4 at the Lexington Correctional Facility. When you attend a show made up of models and miniatures, you expect to find things on a smaller scale. But don't call these toys. This is serious business to the people who deal with the petite for profit or for pleasure. And it's gaining the attention of the people who are young, in age, or at heart. Some of the miniatures are more miniature than others, some of them more realistic, but whatever their size or relationship to reality, they touch a spot in the minds and memories of many people that cannot be touched by the large and cumbersome. This is the first joint show for small railroad and small household fixtures in Oklahoma. For these people, it was a success. A huge success, in fact, for miniatures. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. tremendous number of services for this activity and uh, we now have 2.2 um, everyone knows who's ever
This is what we call the final splash on Aquaticus. You know, we've got two and a half million dollars now. We're trying to get the thing over with. And this is a grassroots dollars for dolphin support. People who donate a dollar or more get a bumper sticker, a dolphin club card, and most importantly, the feeling that they've participated and helped bring the dolphins to Oklahoma. For years, parking spaces have been one of the rarest commodities in downtown Oklahoma City. As the downtown area grew, available parking slots became increasingly difficult to find. 29,000 people commute to work in the downtown area, and there are only 17,000 parking spaces. So most garages have for years had long waiting lists of motorists wanting a spot. But right now, that's not the case. Terry Patello, director of the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority, says the demand is down. And this is the first time that we have uh, not had a waiting list of several hundred people in our facilities. Uh, the general economy, we have had a lot of cancellations of parking contracts uh, through business uh, relocating or business failures even, uh, principally small oil uh, companies. Despite the current surplus of parking spaces, new garages like this one on the corner of Sheridan and Walker are being built. Plans are for five or six new garages to be built in the next few years. Transportation officials say there may be a surplus now, but parking space will soon be at a premium. Debbie Mash, Action 4 in downtown Oklahoma City. When the last cars came off the assembly line during the second shift at Oklahoma's General Motors plant last year, almost 2,400 employees went on unemployment. GM has never recalled any of the second shift workers. Many of them have now exhausted their unemployment benefits. The alien auto industry has put some of the laid off workers in a financial sick bed. But for the first time in a long time, some of the workers will now be receiving a paycheck from the boss. Qualified employees will receive a $300 Christmas bonus from General Motors. What's it mean to him? It means he's getting $300, which obviously isn't going to keep the wolf off the door. Uh, uh, it's going to be better than nothing, and the intent is to show that the, the union and the company both care about its members and its employees. One of those laid-off GM employees is Kenneth Lane. He's been out of a full-time job since last November. He may qualify for the holiday bonus, but he says what he really wants is his job back. Well, it'll help it really well with the Christmas season coming on. It's all that enthusiasm, no, I'd rather be back to work, really, for GM. $300 is 300 you know. <laughs> GM has not yet determined exact eligibility requirements for the holiday payment. Laid-off workers are asked to contact GM at 733-6011 or the UAW at 732-7330. Debbie Mash, Action 4. For a long time, it's been the American dream to own a home. But recently, that dream has become a nightmare. Homes became simply too expensive for a lot of people. Hello, Caroline. Come in. Come in. How are you? Good. 
But for prospective home buyers like Caroline Blue, things are looking up. Caroline is one of a growing number of Oklahomans who are seriously considering purchasing a home. The trend began about three months ago. The reason? Falling interest rates have made it easier for Caroline to sell her current home so she can buy a new one. Before the interest rates started going down, why I, I, I was very uncertain about the, the sale of my place. But since they started lowering, why uh, I've had, um, well, my realtor here has <laughs> brought me several prospective buyers. At this point, all realtors are doing well. Uh, everybody's selling, everybody in my office is selling, the agents that I'm talking to out in the field are selling. The interest rates are encouraging everyone to move a little bit. This sign is going to have to change from for sale to sold because Caroline Blue has decided to buy this home. Oklahoma City realtors like Linda Almaraz can only hope that the home buying fever is catching. Bill Ross, Action 4 in Northwest Oklahoma City. Let's members of my family, the 1980 campaign was sometimes a difficult experience. For these reasons, I believe that my first and overriding obligation now is to Patrick and Cara and Teddy. I will not be a candidate for the presidency of the United States in 1984. I will be in the Senate in the forefront of the struggle for economic growth and social justice and a nuclear freeze. Uh, opportunity for do it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. That's right. Thank you. The rush is on to local department stores. Holiday shoppers are beginning to pack in to their favorite shopping centers. And while the rest of the country will have a fairly dim retailing season, most businesses in Oklahoma are looking forward to a big year at the checkout stand. Great business. We've, uh, we're having uh, very good business now. Anticipate uh, each day prior to Christmas, it just gets better and better. Christmas season is also a traditional time for students and the unemployed to find temporary work. And while the overall economy picture is bleak, most big retailers are planning to hire the same amount of temporary workers as they had last year. Just about on target with uh, years past. Uh, of course, uh, with our self-selection, uh, we haven't uh, needed as many people as uh, we used to when we gave, uh, you know, a more personalized service, but we have not cut back on the numbers of people that we've hired. Now, I well, I've not seen an increase in applicant flow over prior years. I really haven't. So for now, things look good for the temporary employment in Oklahoma City. But if the Christmas season slows down, temporary workers could be working shorter hours and receiving a smaller paycheck. Kevin Ogle, Action 4.
Kerosene space heaters are hot items these days. Hot meaning popular due largely to price efficiency, and hot meaning dangerous due largely to misuse. With that in mind, retailers are taking extra time to give consumers some safety precautions. Construction book comes with the, all the heaters we sell, whether it be electric or whether it be kerosene or whether it be uh, natural gas. So more or less guides to go by if you're going to hook it up yourself. Some of them are vented, some of them are non-vented. Retailers aren't the only ones with the safety tips. Kerosene heaters are not designed for cooking or drying clothes. Keep heaters at least three feet away from walls, furnishings, and other combustibles. Before moving a heater, turn it off and let it cool. This is a safety message from your local fire department.